Hello, I'm Jess Forrester and welcome to Vitae Wednesday. Today we're going to spend an hour learning how to organize a job talk. Today's webinar will be available to view on demand. Everyone who registered for this webinar will receive a link to the recording, so look for an email from Vitae notifying you that it is ready. Or check go.chroniclevitae.com slash webinars, which is where all of our archived webinars are stored. On that same page, you'll also see registration links for our upcoming webinars. Melissa Dalgleish is going to cover Altac cover letters on March 22nd, and Karen is coming back April 12th to talk about negotiating job offers. If you are tweeting along, please use the hashtag VTayWednesday. And if you have technical issues during the webinar, you'll want to refresh your browser. And if that doesn't work, you may want to switch to another browser. Vitae Wednesday webinars work best on either Chrome or Firefox. If you're still having technical issues, please either tweet them to at Chronicle Vitae or email me directly at jess.forrester at chronicle.com. Last but not least, Karen will join us for one hour following the webinar to answer your questions. So please submit questions for Karen at go.chroniclevitae.com slash job talk. And with that, I'll let Karen get us started. All right. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, as always, uh, for hosting me for these Vitae Wednesday webinars. And thank you to all of you who have come. Um, I am so glad to, uh, to, well, I'm not really seeing you, but uh, to know that you're out there and learning step-by-step uh, -step how to manage the academic job market. We've been together for quite a few of these webinars, um, starting from the very beginning, how to think about the job market through the applications, through uh, basic interviewing skills, and now here we are at the job talk. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, and as I am always uh, want to, to tell you, uh, if you find these webinars valuable, please do check out my book, The Professor is In, The Essential Guide to Turning Your PhD into a Job, because the book, which is about 12 bucks on Amazon, has a lot more information on it than I can manage to fit into a one-hour webinar, and also has a lot more scripts of kinds of verbiage and language that you can use, as well as examples of the kinds of mistakes that people make at every stage of the job application process. And in addition to that, it also talks about grant writing and um, the post-academic transition for those of you who, after you give it the old college try, you decide you might want to move on to try something else. Sorry, uh, my, uh, my, my advance button is acting a little bit funny, so that's why that keeps happening. But in any case, uh, forgive me for that. So you might wonder, so some of you may have been with me last month when I gave a webinar on the campus visit, and you may be wondering, well, why does she need an entire webinar just on the job talk uh, when she's already talked about the campus visit? And the reason is that the job talk is uh, the most important element of a campus visit on those visits where it is required. And I do want to take a moment here. Some of you may be wondering, but what about the teaching demo? Yeah, there is such a thing as a teaching demo. Sometimes it's required. Sometimes it is required in addition to a research job talk. Sometimes it replaces a research job talk. I'm not talking about a teaching demo today. That is a different subject requiring a different approach and a different webinar. So we're not talking about that. We're talking only about a research job talk today. Now, having said that, um, if you have been asked to do a research job talk, it is absolutely the highlight of your campus visit. And even if you do great on everything else, if you don't do well on the job talk, it is very unlikely that you're going to be offered the job. And yet, at the same time, the job talks that I saw when I was a professor, the job talks that I, um, um, that I read that my students wrote, and now the job talks drafts that I see as the professor is in are just overwhelmingly missing the mark. It is really something. It is, and, I, and I don't say this lightly because I run a business 
where I deal with people's writings for the job market and correct misunderstandings and, and try to help people figure out what the ethos and the agenda is and how to meet it in their writing. But within the context of all the many, many errors that, that candidates make on the academic job market, the job talk is in some ways the very worst. I don't know why. I don't know why people get so confused about the ethos and agenda of a job talk. But basically, I hazard a few, you know, uh, uh, you know, speculations here. There is misunderstanding of the of the point of a job talk. What is the purpose of it? Um, you know, what what does the what does the department want to see? when they have invited you and when you're delivering this paper. Second, um, there's inexperience. You know, some people who are on the market may not have given a lot of talks in their life and may not really have a great sense of how to organize a talk um, and, how, and then particularly how to handle the Q&A afterwards. And then there's the classic um, vein of the job seekers and the, and the academics in general existence, which is insecurity, or what we, we might call imposter syndrome, and basically feeling like I'm still not good enough. I'm never good enough. And this is something that you know plagues academics at every stage of their career. And please, please don't think that just because you have like gotten a job or you have gotten tenure that that insecurity goes away. It uh, it often doesn't. So it's something to really look at very seriously right now. So let me now go more into more detail about the job talk and where it fits in. So if you were with me last time for the campus visit, I told you this thing, that you are being scrutinized from the minute you step out of the airport until the minute that you just peer back through the doors of the airport um, without, without a break. There's no off time. There's no off the record uh, for your scholarship. Um, and the scholarship is not, however, well, let me just run through this list of three. Scholarship, your tenure ability, in other words, are you showing the ability at this point to pass your third year review in, third, in three years and your tenure case in approximately six years? They are ex absolutely examining that, and they are absolutely discussing that after you leave in their meeting where they decide who to offer the job to. They are saying, is, are these candidates set up to get tenure? Did they indicate they are a safe bet for tenure? So please understand that's a major priority, even if you are just ABD. And then collegiality. Are you someone that we can talk to? Are you someone we can get along with? Can you answer questions? Can you take challenges in a collegial and open way? That's what's being um, examined. Now going back to scholarship, please understand they're not at this point demanding that you justify your basic topic your methods, your theory, or your conclusions. If they had any questions about those things, you would not have been invited. But you were invited. Out of, say, 500 people who applied, three people were invited for a campus visit, and you are one of those three. That means they already believe that your scholarship is totally legit. So you don't have to go in in a defensive posture proving that. And I, I'm, I'm belaboring this point because that's actually one of the major problems with the job talks that I see is the candidates are, are, are like, um, well, in the words of our current uh, horrendous administration, you, you're constantly relitigating <laughs> the basics of your research. And that is not to be done because they have already accepted the premises of your research. Now, to learn more about the campus visit, you can go back and view the webinar that I gave last time. So uh, absolutely, please do that. And all of the webinars are always available for free to be viewed after the fact on the Vitae um, website. OK, so here, so let's get, let's get more specific now. So the biggest problem for um, the job talk is that you come in acting like a grad student. And what I am talking about is, um, when I say that you are relitigating the basic premises of your research, is the topic okay? Are your methods okay? Have, um, are your, is your theory okay? That's what I mean by acting like a grad student. It's like people come in, it's like they're trying to prove to their advisor that their research idea is legitimate. But that's a thing that you, that's a battle you fought three or four years ago or two or three years ago, I don't know how long, however long it took you to get to this point, and that battle is finished. You won that thing. And now you're on a campus visit, and you are 
um, now presenting your formal research in an authoritative way where you own the space, you own the subject, you own the approach, and you own your contribution. Now, one of the main ways that um, this comes out, uh, this, this you act like a grad student pitfall, is that you do too much literature review. That's one of the very biggest problems, and the big three of the job talk pitfalls is you do too much literature review. And why do you do that? Because you're insecure, because you're acting like a grad student, you're treating it like your comprehensive exams. You want to prove to these people who you are completely intimidated by that you have read X and Y and Z and A and B and C and D and E and F and G and H and I and J. And they don't want to know that. They don't want to know that, and you are wasting your precious, precious job talk time by going back into the literature. So the mission of a job talk is, as I said, it's the highlight of the visit. You have to, uh, you have to, you know, you've got to, you've got to do well on this. Um, it is not for you to prove that you're smart or that you've read all the literature because they have already accepted that. And they believe you. You have convinced them. That's why you're there in the first place. It does have to offer a snapshot of your research in a manageable and accessible way. And this is now, we're heading into the other error that people often make, which is, um, uh, which is um, uh, overshooting the research and trying to do too much um, and pre present you know, the entire scope of, uh, of everything that they've ever done um, which is not doable in a 45-minute job talk. So it, yes, it has to be sophisticated, but it has to be manageable and accessible. And finally, um, it has to uh, the job talk experience itself at a kind of meta level has to demonstrate, it has to illustrate that you are a good teacher, even if it's not a teaching demo, they are still evaluating your charisma and your ability to hold the attention of a room. And they are extrapolating from that to your classroom presence. And then they are absolutely examining your ability to handle the Q&A. The Q&A, I could do an entire webinar on the Q&A to tell you the truth. I really could because job talks are, in my experience, as a professor, as a faculty member, all the years that I was um, in departments looking at people come through giving talks, uh, it was the Q&A where people um, lost, you know, they would maintain their poise up until the Q&A and, uh, and, then, and then sort of fall down and, and, and lose, you know, lose their credibility for the job at that point. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, so here is the ethos of the job talk. Um, as I've already talked about, but now let me get much more specific about what I mean. When I say you're not acting like a grad student, when I say you are acting like a colleague, a peer, an authority in the field, it's that you are an intellectual of the very first rank, that you have something important to say, that you are a figure in your field or fields, however that is being defined by the job, that you are speaking as a peer to other writers in your field, other thinkers in your field, that you are able to challenge orthodoxies, which means that you aren't just saying, I am building on the important work of so-and-so and adding to the important conversation around such-and-such, such, because if all you're doing is building and adding, then you are not uh, occupying a leadership position, and you need to occupy that leadership position in the field where you challenge things and push the field forward. You have enthusiasm for your ideas. You could present them energetically. And oddly enough, those of you who know a little bit about the professors in, you know that we do live Skype, campus visit prep, job talk prep, and interview prep. So Kelly Weinhold, uh, my partner, primarily handles those now, but I also handle a number of them and have over many years. And one of the interesting things that happens in the live Skypes is that um, – is that sometimes people present their job talks on Skype, like it's a mock job talk, and they look so bored, so bored. And we often find ourselves saying two things. Do you want this job? Because you really don't look like you do. That's the first thing. And the second thing, do you like your research? Because you seem 
so bored by it right now. So when I say, you know, be have this kind of energy, this excitement to get your ideas out, that's another thing that the job talk demonstrates. Now, please understand, of course, I'm not telling you to be all like, oh, my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Like, you don't tell them that. You merely demonstrate it by the energy with which you present your ideas. Um, now, the sharing your ideas with students comes out in a meta way, usually, um, in the sense that, they, like I said, they're extrapolating from your job talk presentation to how you'll be in the classroom. Um, and then when, uh, and then that you can take questions that might be challenging or come out of left field or be unexpected, unpredictable, because classrooms, as you know, are unpredictable. They are also extrapolating that. And um, and in addition, in the Q&A, they are checking to see the degree to which if someone says to you, you know, when I heard what you were saying, it made me think this, and this is slightly different than the conclusion you reached, but I wonder what you would say to that, that you can engage in it and find inspiration in that in a collegial way. And finally, of course, the job talk does, and this is actually, I have this last, but this is quite important because this is something... This is, this is one of the errors that candidates make. Um, your job talk has to show that you are contributing to the department, and that means that you're showing you understand the department. Now, this is something I'm going to talk more about, I, or, or sorry, that I did talk more about in the campus visit, and I'm not talking so much about today. But the point is, if you're dealing with a department, and I'm going to give my own example from cultural anthropology, you know, um, because it's, and I'm going to hope uh, you know that you can extrapolate from this. But in cultural anthropology, there are departments that are very, very, very theoretical, very humanistic, very much into critical theory. There are also departments who are the opposite and who are very empirical, very social sciency, very much about quantitative methods and things like that. And these two depart, these two styles of departments are quite different, and they really don't overlap very much. Um, if I am going to the latter kind of department, I cannot give a job talk that is hypercritical theory, hyper theoretical, and very, very divorced from concrete empirical um, uh, methodologies. And, of course, vice versa. So you have to write a job talk that actually sh contributes to the department as it is. You have to speak the language that they understand. So in the end, and this is a line um, by um, Rick Reese of Tomorrow's Professor, remember that the job talk is not a defense of your work. You don't have to prove your competence. Like I already said, it is a demonstration of your ability to contribute and collaborate as a peer, as a colleague. That's what, the, that's what the point of this thing is. So as you try to prepare for this thing, especially if you're new to it. Please attend all the job talks you can. Attend them in every field, every department, every – please, please, please don't just wait until you find one that's in your own field. That is a mistake. Go to anything at all that is available to you because you're going to see how people manage the moment. You're going to see the mistakes they make. You're going to see what they do well. And you're going to see how the audience interacts with them. And that's the best prep that you can get. If you have the opportunity to listen to uh, faculty kibitzing afterwards, so don't rush out of the room right away. After the job talk is over and people are dispersing, um, see if you can kind of hang about and listen to what the faculty are saying about it. That's going to be really fantastic evidence for you of what worked and what didn't from the faculty perspective, which may be different from your own understandings. And you need to, you know, listen to them because they're they're the faculty. They're the ones who have experience with this. And um, and of course, you know, use all the preparation material that you can um, to guide you that experience, as well as, of course, this webinar and other um, writing that you can find on my blog, for example, in my book, and other stuff on the job talk that's available, perhaps in your own field. So for example, I know that STEM fields, um, there are, when I Google academic job talk you know, advice, um, aside from the professor is in, a, a number of different uh, sites come up, usually from the STEM fields. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how to deliver a good STEM job talk. 
All right. So um, when you get this invitation, you must know the parameters. You must know them exactly. Never make assumptions. And if something is even slightly unclear, please ask to have it clarified. Most importantly, how much time will you have? How much time will you have? You have to know. And whatever they tell you, that is your gospel. If they tell you 40 minutes, you have 40 minutes. You do not have 41 minutes. You do not have 42 minutes. You have 40. Uh, you need to know who's in the audience. This can differ quite a bit. Some uh, research institutions will tell you, will, will, it will of course be um, faculty in the department and affiliated departments, whereas at liberal arts colleges, sometimes it's a whole bunch of undergraduates in addition to the faculty. You need to know. Um, you need to know what is the format. In other words, what, uh, you know, um, is, it, is it a formal research talk? Or is it more of a split research talk and teaching demo? Um, are they asking you to come in? This is actually quite common. They may be asking you to come in and deliver a 50-minute talk in total with 40 minutes of, a, of it on your research and 10 minutes of it on your teaching. So, uh, departments that I knew back at Illinois used to do that. It was not my department, but the history department did that. So you have to make sure that you speak for exactly 40 minutes on your research, have a nice conclusion, and then say, now I turn to my teaching element and speak on that for 10 minutes. So you have to know that. And you do have to know what technology will be available and make sure that you, you know, understand the slide setup, make sure you are bringing the right dongle you know, for uh, you know, converting a Mac or whatever it is that has to be done. All right, so here's the first question from the group. How should you pick a topic on, you know, to present for your job talk because you can't present the entire dissertation? Fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so the, one of the most common mistakes that people make is they try to present too much. They try to run through the entire dissertation and end up just sort of skimming over a bunch of very vague generalities uh, and not giving a, a real concrete, you know, vivid sense of how the person is doing research and how the, how the person constructs an argument. So please, please uh, pick one chapter from your dissertation. So in other words, what you're looking for is a microcosm. This doesn't cover every argument that you make or every everything that you did. It just covers one, but it covers it well and thoroughly so that then they can say, ah, when he looked at this question, he looked at it very deeply, very comprehensively, and he reached a very clear conclusion from it, and he used great materials and great methods. And now I can see that if he did it for that, then he's going to be, have, bring the same level of care and sophistication to the other topics that he addresses. So one topic from, typically speaking, typically speaking, I mean, this is hard to generalize, but typically from one chapter of your dissertation, and that topic needs to match the job ad. So if you have you know, a chapter, let's say you have a chapter and one of your chapters is on the gender aspect and one of your chapters is on the race aspect and one of your chapters is on the class aspect, but the job ad specifically said that one of their hiring priorities was gender, then make sure you pick the chapter on gender because that is going to speak to the stated goals of the department. And again, you're going to need to look at the department and say, and again, allow me to use my own field as an example. I'm going to look at that department and I'm going to say, okay, so I have a gender discussion in my dissertation and uh, one of my chapters on gender is all about post-structuralist feminist theory, which I love. And one of my gender chapters is all about the conclusions of my participant observation and survey data from my field work in Japan. I'm a Japan scholar. Um, which one of those chapters should I use? Well, what kind of department is it? Is it a super theory department? Is it a super empirical department? You're going to make that choice. So be very political, very savvy. I don't want to say political. That makes it sound like it's insincere. It's not insincere. You, you're, you do both things. Let's, let's just say, you know, for argument's sake, you do both things. You care about both things. You're just savvy enough to make sure that the part of your work that you do is the part that is going to be speak most vividly to that department based on who they are, what they do, and how they define the job ad. Okay, 
I hope that was helpful. Now, let's talk organization here. Um, you, the, the core here is that you have to stick to your time. That's about 25 double spaced pages for a 50 minute talk. And you have to make one basic point. So please, this is, I've said this a few times already and I'm going to say it a few times more. You make one point. One point. Don't make 20 points. Don't make five points. Make one point. So you have an introduction. You say, in this talk I'm going to, blah, blah, blah. And then in the talk you do blah, blah, blah. And in the conclusion you say, in this talk I discuss blah, blah, blah. And in all of those cases the blah, blah, blah is the same thing. Okay. I'm belaboring this because this is one of the places where people go off. You get, I think what happens is that people who are going to uh, job, giving job talks just freak out. I think you all just, I think we all just freak out. I freaked out. I freaked out when I wrote job talks back in the day. I don't do, I don't say this in a judgmental way because I have been this job candidate. Um, but we freak out. And uh, and we think, oh my God, like I'm so unworthy, and I, they have to know all these things. They have to know I can do A and B and C and D and E and F. And uh, and I think that's probably why this happens. But no, they need to know that you can do this one thing, and you do this one thing well. And then they're like, okay, that means if she does this one thing so well, she'll do other things so well. Now, it is absolutely imperative you stick to the time, and the reason is this: this is fundamentally respect. And, and this is something different than I have on this slide. But I'm speaking now as a former faculty member. Karen, we can't hear you. Oh. Now I can. Okay. It sounds broken up, though. Can you make sure you're plugged in all the way? Yeah. Yeah. Weird. Oh, how, how is it now? That sounds better. Okay. Uh, it's still breaking up some, actually. Huh. All right. Let oh, me see. No, you sound good. What I can do. All right. Okay. Go ahead. That's so strange. I'm sorry about that. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. Um, anyway, okay. So yes, the time limit um, is there. Um, well, so, uh, you, so there, there, the idea of disrespect, that you think your ideas are more important than our needs and our needs. So stick to the time. And then there are some other less, you know, emotionally fraught reasons. Everybody should have the same chance. So if three people come, three people should all get 50 minutes and no more. Um, and furthermore, faculty schedules are extremely busy. And they can't, people can't just give you another 20 minutes. They can't. Even if they want to, even if they're not angry like I used to get, they can't. They're too busy. So you're going to lose your audience. And also, this is a this is a, this is another test of your intellectual ability as a scholar. Is if you can't explain your work in 50 minutes, then we have serious doubts about your you know basic credibility as a scholar. So you just need to do it. So really stick to the time. Okay, here's another question. Um, I have a lot of previous experience. I think this is an advantage, but it's tricky figuring out how to present the whole package. So I leave most of the past out and focus on the most recent research. Um, yes, your, your final question, the answer to that is yes. You should leave the past out and focus on the most recent research because as a PhD, um, well, and please allow me to, I'm going to answer this and then I'm going to give you a caveat. But in general, as a general rule, departments are looking at your most recent work. They're looking at your dissertation work. They don't want to hear about your master's work. They don't want to hear about a previous, you know, some other work that you did. They're judging you. If you're a PhD applicant, you're recent, and you're saying that you're a recent PhD, well, actually, I think you're saying you're a recent PhD, um, they are evaluating you on your dissertation work. And so that's really what they want to hear. Now, um, the only caveat to that is, and this is something that comes up occasionally, 
if the job ad was defined in such a way that it speaks to some of your other work that you did, and it doesn't speak quite completely directly to your dissertation work, then there is a little bit of a question as to whether you should put the job talk entirely focused on your dissertation or you should incorporate some other research that you've done if that other research speaks more directly to the job ad. Um, if you are confronted with that very, very particular set of circumstances, then I would urge you to um, actually ask the search committee. And those of you who know me, have been to my webinars, who have worked with me, you know that 95% of the time I tell you don't bother the search committee with your neurotic questions because it's too much and they're overwhelmed and they get annoyed. So you know I don't say this lightly. I mainly tell candidates to just plow ahead with their best information they have available and don't pepper the search committee with questions stemming from your anxiety. But in this particular case, when you get to the point where you're on a campus visit, you're one of three people, they have invited you, they have made this investment in you, and it appears that you're that the job ad it may be interested in something other than just your own dissertation research and maybe something else you did, then in that case, yeah, get in touch with them and ask uh, and see what they and see what they tell you. So okay. All right. So as I said, limit the scope. Um, so here is some language that will show you what I mean when I say limit the scope. So many, many people will t launch into the talk looking like what I have on the left side of the screen, which is today I'll be talking about a book project. And it's tentatively titled this. And I have looked at a bunch of different questions like this and this and this and this. And some of the questions I found, or some of the answers I found, have revolved around this. And I'll be, you know, talking my way through those in the, in the chapters as I proceed through this job talk. Very bad. Very bad because it's vague, it's too large, it's unfocused, um, and you'll end up if you if you just think about it, if you divide fifty minutes, you know across you know a bunch of different chapters, the level of detail you can provide for each is going to be very very low. So um, the better language is on the right. Um, uh, today I'll be talking about a section of my book project. My book project as a whole deals with this, but today I will be introducing only one part of it. I will be examining specifically this topic. My talk will center on this author's work, specifically the novel blah, blah, blah title, and in particular the, her main character blah, blah, blah. And I will explore that character and his this and that and the other thing in order to demonstrate how it represents blah, blah, blah. So you see that you've laid out in your very opening of the job talk a very specific question. Now, I am going to draw your attention again to the job ad. Go back to that job ad and look at what they say. Look at it again and again and again. Look at it when you're writing your application. Look at it when you're going into the, the conference interview. Look at it when you're prepping for the campus visit. And look at it again when you're writing your job talk. What did that ad say? We're especially interested in candidates who use this thing and that thing, who do this thing and that thing, who have expertise in this thing and that thing. And make sure that your talk is speaking to that. Then stay on point. So now you've introduced that topic very specifically. Now make sure you stay on that topic. Please stay on the topic and don't go off into a digression where by the end of the talk you have answered a different question than the one that you proposed in the beginning. Furthermore, this is a formal presentation. I don't know how many of you out there are, um, are uh, British, but if you're British, uh, this is a really important point for you. Because one of the places where the British, uh, the British and the American job market have a lot of overlap, and then some very, very important points of deviation. <laughs> um, there's more overlap than there is deviation, but the points where they do deviate are very important. And one of those points is, um, is in the formality level of talks. Um, an American job talk is very formal. 
a British job talk is uh, is kind of chatty and, and conversational. I don't know. Wh- I'm not going to go into the reasons why this is, but I know that this is the case. So we, if you're coming to the U.S. and you're giving a job talk, you need to make sure you're using very formal language. So don't do this kind of. So then I was thinking, and that made me wonder. And I thought, oh my gosh, I really should look into the question of this. And so I decided to. And then, as I'm sure you can anticipate, that just led to a whole new thing. You know, no, don't use that language. You have have to be quite formal. Focusing on this in place of why reveals this, and on that, that, and it is on that perspective that I will focus in this talk today, and I will uh, show that. Blah blah blah. Um, as you construct your v- verbiage for the job talk, this the same thing is true for this as is true for your interviews and for your cover letters and other documents. Please banish any try language. Seek, hope, attempt, endeavor, try. So when you say my dissertation attempts to show, replace that with my dissertation shows. In this work, I attempt to show. In this work, I show. In this talk, I hope to show you. In this talk, I will show you. So that's the first thing. And the second set are worthy of study, deserve study, merit study, because that's actually, those are clues to the relitigation problem, where you're going back to being in that subject position of a grad student, being extremely anxious, and saying, I swear, I swear, please, please, please believe me that my topic is important. Mm -mm, Your topic's important. If you did it, it's important. If you're shortlisted, it's important. If you're there at a job talk, it's important. No need to uh, to 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 go back and uh, beg because basically that's kind of begging. Um, beg them to believe that. Um, now, jargon. You know jargon's bad. You know it. You know it. Everybody tell. I assume that everybody tells you this. I hope everybody that you talk to about the job market tells you this. I certainly tell you this. If you've been with me through the last five webinars, I've said this in every single one of them. Please don't use jargon. If you're in the fields of English, complet, ethnic studies, gender studies, or romance languages, or film studies, which I forgot to put down here, um, you are pr- uh, particularly prone to this. And I really want you to listen to me. If you are from a school like Berkeley, or NYU, and you are going out into the world for campus visits, and you're interviewing at Iowa State, and you're interviewing at, you know, uh, uh, I'm just blanking out. Even even our ones like the University of Oregon, you know, really solid, you know, ranking institutions, and you go out to those places and you speak the kind of crazy insular jargon that all the grad students are using in your complet program at Berkeley or your complet program at NYU, you're going to alienate everybody. So please uh, really have people from outside your department study your job talk. Because if you ask someone inside your department, they're going to speak the same jargon that you do, and they're not going to catch how problematic it is. And then the issue of of humor. just, uh, you know, you don't have to be humorless, of course. A humor is a great thing. It shows your collegiality and everything. But this isn't really, the job talk's not really the place to be cracking jokes. So the humor is better when it emerges more organically and naturally over the course of your visit, less so in the job talk itself. Now, um, I'm going to speak uh, here about um, one particular um, issue that arises particularly for people in the social sciences. So anthropology, sociology, and affiliated fields that, um, that are often um, quoting uh, people. But this can also, uh, actually, this is also a problem for literature, where you're quoting extensive passages from, 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 from works of writing. So, uh, but in any case, where you have, let's just say this example here, uh, you have interviewed someone, and this person says, your informant, your participant says, I don't know how I feel about vaccines. Sometimes I support them, but sometimes I get anxious. And then you have language that says, so you've quoted them, and then you have the next sentence is, and my subject explained that like many respondents, he feels ambivalent about vaccines, sometimes supporting them and sometimes not. Um, So as you can see, you're basically wasting people's time by uh, completely restating in your own words what they just said. This is a very common error in job talks in the social sciences. Um, As you write your talk, um, you're going to be so nervous 
probably, assuming that you're here with me today, you don't have a ton of experience. So I, I, so I would assume that many of you who are here today, you're going to be very nervous. I was certainly very nervous. Um, so don't think that you're going to remember extemporaneous remarks. When I gave job talks, um, I always wrote in the quote-unquote extemporaneous remarks so that I would remember when I had sort of an aside or a slightly humorous observation or something that I would actually write it in and not assume that I would remember it. All right. And then, um, hang on, let me just look at this. For, oh, I see. I, the, uh, we got a little bit of a... Um, uh, part of the next slide is on this slide. So this thing here, have a strong, expansive conclusion that speaks to significance to the wider field. So now I'm moving from the extemporaneous remarks thing to, a, to larger questions of organization and preparation. So when you write the job talk, after you have that intro and you have the body of the work, make sure that you conclude. Uh, don't just dribble off. Conclude strongly in a way that points to the contribution of your work. Because again, if you remember where I began and I said you're a peer and you're an authority and you're contributing to your discipline, this conclusion of your job talk is where you remind them. This work that I just presented to you, it moves the field of anthropology forward by showing this, by uh, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating this. That's, what, that's something that they want to hear. Um, other issues related to the delivery of your job talk, please don't read, although it is very, very common in most fields in the humanities and social sciences to still work from a paper. STEM fields tend to be somewhat more where you only come in with a bunch of slides and then sort of speak from the slides. So I, there are disciplinary differences here. But most job talks do in the other fields still work from a paper, and that's fine. I'm not telling you not to. But please don't just stare at the paper. Please make a Abundant eye contact. Be very engaged. Know that talk so that you don't have to read word for word. Make eye contact, gesture, move around to the extent that you can. Um, attend to your body language. I know that Amy Cuddy's TED Talk and the research it was based on have been debunked. If you don't know that, you can look into it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore the whole thing. But the point is, is that Amy Cuddy does have some rather good points, regardless of the research they're based on. But she just has some good points about body language, which is just have firm and confident body language, square your shoulders, lift your chin, have expansive arm gestures. And her argument is if you do that body language, it will make you subjectively feel more confident. Apparently, that could not be replicated. But nevertheless, just you know, the, the good body language is still good body language because it does communicate confidence to, the, to your audience. And please don't ever turn your back on the audience. When you're gesturing and looking at your slides, um, don't, uh, you know, make sure, just like a good performer, for those of you who have been on the stage, remember that even as you're looking backward toward the slides, you need to keep your, your body basically oriented toward your audience. They are more important than your slides. They're the people who are going to be uh, voting <laughs> on your candidacy. <laughs> so make sure you're making eye contact with them. All right, so Delandra Davis has a great question here. If you're aware that your research cuts against the grain of popular schools of thought, should you tone it down or trust that they selected you knowing what your research is about and want to hear the most cutting-edge aspects of it? Um, but does this open up you to grilling and challenge by some less enthusiastic members? I love this question so much. So, um, but it's very political, <laughs> and it isn't easy to answer in a in a general sense. Um, but you absolutely, if they, if you absolutely candidly demonstrated your approach and argument in your application, and they shortlisted you, then they know what they're getting, and you should not try to hide from who you really are at this point. So yeah, you need to present what is true and correct for your approach. But when you say, does this open you up to some real grilling and challenges? Oh yeah. Oh yes, it does. And what I hope for you is that you have enough experience from having presented at your national conferences and having given talks around your department and doing a mock job talk. And I really, if you are in a person in this situation, I really urge you to do more than one mock job talk if you can. With, and I hope your, your professors in your department will, will cooperate with that. But you have to get used to dealing with grilling. 
Um, my dissertation topic was, and I'm not gonna, I, I'm not going to go into the details because I want to make sure we get through all of our content today. But my dissertation topic was controversial. My approach was controversial, and I got slammed in Q and A's the entire time that I did that research. Uh, from the very first talk I ever gave on it, which completely floored me. I mean, I think I went I left that talk in, in tears because I had was so, I didn't expect to get the attacks that I did. But then I continued to get the same challenges over and over and over again. By the time I was on the job market, I knew what those challenges were, and I knew exactly why I disagreed with them. I knew which ones I agreed with, and I had, and I had adjusted my my work to accommodate those views that I did agree with. But I also knew that some of the challenges were not legitimate, and I needed to be able to explain why. And so uh, that is the, because of all that experience, I was able to anticipate the challenges, to create verbiage that responded to the challenges, to uh, very very unemotionally, very calmly um, explain why I took the position I did. And in the end, it was it. It was it was fine. It was all you know perfectly fine. But it took a lot of practice and a lot of experiences and some really tough, some really tough moments. So yes, please uh, absolutely be prepared. If you know that you're presenting a controversial thought and approach, please be prepared for how to deal with it. So because you're very nervous, the stakes are there are no higher stakes in the academic career, none, than the camp than the job talk of a campus visit. So please don't be improvising there. <laughs> improvise. Don't improvise at all. Prep. Write out, write out answers. Write down every challenge you've ever gotten. Write down every challenge you ever can anticipate getting. And then start constructing your responses. And make them two-minute responses. Remember, don't be all crazy and give a 10-minute response. That's very alienating and boring. Two-minute response to all of those challenges and then get used to delivering them. So again, this is the kind of interview prep I always tell people to do is write out answers and practice them so that they begin to feel natural. That's the answer to this as well. All right. So very quickly, let's go through a basic um, uh, structure for your job talk. So if you have a, um, a typical length job talk, um, you're, you should divide it this way, um, 15 minutes for background, 10 minutes for your approach, 10 minutes for your results, and about 10 minutes for your summary and conclusion. And I love this thing, and this is from Jonathan Danzig and tomorrow's professor. This um, shows who your target audience is So, um, because it shifts a little bit. Um, your intro is, uh, is, is going to be so general that even your parents would understand it. Um, and I'm going to talk about why that is in a second. Your approach is going to show that you, um, uh, the people in your field uh, and related fields will be able to see what you're doing. Your results show that you are an authority in your field, that you took the methods and the theory of your field and you brought them to bear on a subject and you reached an innovative, original conclusion that pushes your discipline forward. And then the summary at the end, we go back, we pull that angle back out to another wider angle and say, let's now show how that amazing conclusion uh, relates to the bigger picture of the discipline and related disciplines and the world at large. All right. Um, so, um, Basic organizational issues, uh, the three T's. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them the thing. And tell them what you told them. These are, this is a basic organizational rule for almost all talks, not just job talks, but all talks. And this is why you can actually do quite a bit less in a job talk than you think you can. This is why I keep harping on have one point and one point only. Because when you divide that job talk into the parts where you are telling them that you're going to tell them and then you tell them the thing and then you tell them what you told them, there's only room for really one thing. Now the most important thing I want you guys to understand um, in terms of your actual constructing language for the talk itself is, in my opinion, as a professor is in, is that your opening is the most important part and it's the place where most people go wrong. So please, read this slide closely. Start with an orienting introduction that announces the goal and layout of the talk, where you're going, where you're going to end up in about one to two short paragraphs so that by the end of page one you've done this and, and, may, and aim this for a very general audience and do not try to go into extreme disciplinary sophistication here. 
stay very accessible. Thank you for having me today. My research overall examines the issue of X. Specifically, I investigate X from the perspective of Y. I use the blob theory and I use blob methods. Today, I'll be presenting just one part of that research, focusing on this. I will discuss this from the perspective of this in order to argue this. In this paper, I will uh, examine blah, 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 and I will conclude this. I believe this is important for the field of anthropology because it shows us this. And that's it. Have that as your first paragraph. Most people forget it. It really should not be forgotten. Now here's an example. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm a scholar of Korean theater and performance. My work overall looks at representations of national identity and live performance in Korea and the U.S. from the early 20th century to the present. Specifically, I focus on this and I analyze it from that. Now this is only, this is the positioning. This is the opening. Um, so going back to that, then you would then continue. Um, Today, in my talk today, I will present one part of this, um, I, of this larger project. I will specifically be looking at the theatrical performance blah, which dates from 1958 and was performed by the blah, blah, blah troupe. And I am going to take that theatrical performance, I'm going to examine it in light of this and that in order to show this and that, and I will conclude this and that. So that's what you need to do in the beginning. Uh, so here is another um, example of how this looks. This is, this is a different example of verbiage that you can use as you construct this all-important first paragraph. Now, as you lay this out, now you're sort of in the second paragraph. In my analysis, I will explore the following questions. Blah and blah, blah. How does it illustrate? How does it connect? What are its limits? I contend that. Big reveal. Um, after you've done all that, and that's pretty much the first, just about the first page, first two pages, then your impulse is going to be to go into lit review. Please don't do that. I said it before, say it again. Don't cite a billion sources. They trust you. This is not your comprehensive exams. Just cite a couple and say, you know, I'm drawing from the work of X. I'm in dialogue with the work of Y. But unlike many works in the field of blah, um, uh, I am focusing on, a quest on the question of blah, blah, blah. And then proceed on your way and don't cite works after that. You want to be sure that you specify your methods and your theories. Who did you talk to? When did you talk to them? Where did you talk to them? And granted, I'm speaking from an anthro perspective, but you guys can all extrapolate onto your own, you know, into your own disciplinary fields. But who, what, when, where, how? We have to know these things. And what central questions did you examine, which are, of course, when you ask what questions did you examine, that's always a theoretical question. And then you walk through it all. You, 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 you provide the answers. And then, um, I mean, you, you walk your audience through all of those things. And then in the conclusion, you, uh, you ask, what did you find? What did you argue? And what does it tell us? And again, what does it tell us is that place where you open the optic out wider and speak again to the way the research is, its contribution, its significance, pushing the field forward. It, the, that conclusion can also, um, also speak to what is left to answer. Um, this issue of what is left to answer is somewhat disciplinary, discipline specific. The STEM fields really, really like to have this discussion. You know, it's sort of like where you say you've given all of your conclusions and then you say, now let me speak very, you know, let me mention the limitations and let me point to future research. Um, the humanities don't love this. The social sciences are mixed. Psychology tends to do this. Other social sciences do not. So in terms of the what is left to answer, that may be something that you want to study your disciplinary models for. All right, so a few basics on just good presentation rules for all talks, not just job talks. Of course you need visuals, but please don't over rely on them. Please, 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 please limit them. If you have a 50-minute talk, please don't use more than about 25 slides. I know you're like, oh, that's not enough. Well, please. Uh, you need to leave them up for a couple minutes per slide for the audience to grasp them. Uh, one of the biggest problems people make is too many slides. 
Um, also, actually, I'm going to go back to the slide issue. Please don't over cram your slides. Have a lot of white space. Have a lot of margin. Uh, have very big font that even people in the very back row can see without straining. Another major error that people make. Now, as you're delivering, slow down. And this is, please, I beg you, get, uh, get the opportunity for a mock job talk. It's so important. You get nervous, you talk too fast. Everybody does it. Slow down, breathe, speak from your diaphragm. And as you deliver the talk, get used to looking around the room so that you divide the room, the audience, into quadrants, and you sort of address a chunk to each quadrant. So you look over to your left, you look over to the middle, you look over to the right. I said quadrants, but it's a little bit easier to think of it in threes, left, middle, right, and three is fine. If you don't do four, don't worry about it. Um, if you use a laser pointer, don't like, you know, fling that little red dot all over the place in a kind of maniacal way. You know, try to be very slow and deliberate. Again, slow down. And the way that you can do that most effectively is to practice. All right, so let's speak briefly about the Q&A. Um, I would like to urge you to read the blog post that I have, which is called How Women Can Speak Better in Public. And please note that this is not just for women. Um, and, I, and I really need to change the title because that's, uh, it's an old title and it's not, it's not gendered. I mean, well, it is gendered. I mean, women do oftentimes um, are somewhat more prone to, um, to, to shrinking back in the face of an attack. But it is something that everybody does tend to struggle with at one point or another. So learning how to respond to challenges. So Jalandra had another um, question that was really good. Um, terrified of the Q&A, am I going to get crucified by questioners? Um, do you have advice on how to handle this? So when you go into, so first of all, please read my Vitae column called The Curse of the Interdisciplinary PhD. Uh, because interdisciplinary folks do have a challenge, and so it's good to be prepared for that. Um, um, and so if you know, it is, it is unlikely. So to answer this, you have to know who is in your audience and what department you're applying for a job for. So you may be in an interdisciplinary field, but you may be interviewed in a disciplinary department. And then those folks are going to be quite focused on their own discipline. So don't, don't assume that you're going to be attacked on a lot of different disciplines. You will probably be queried on the discipline of the job itself, its methodology, its canon, its readings, its theory. So uh, just be sure that you are equally comfortable with handling that for all the disciplines that your work covers. So that if your work is sort of bridges history and anthro, well then if you go for a history job, you can speak very clearly to historian concerns. Go to an anthro job, you're speaking to anthro concerns and vice versa. All right, so I want to uh, say a few more words about this. When you get a challenging question in the Q&A, please don't, it is not necessarily vicious. It's not necessarily meant to destroy you. There is a departmental choreography that's very common where oftentimes the alpha males will jump in first. The senior alpha males, the, the most senior males in the department, this is very common, saw it over and over again in my career, would jump in with a very challenging question and their goal was to test your poise. They, they wanted to see you succeed, but they were, gonna, they were determined to see you succeed in the face of a challenge. And so don't just fall apart. Just keep your poise and use some language like this. Well, thank you for raising that point. That is a very interesting observation. Um, and so the, the question here might be, well, I think that Nelson reaches a completely different conclusion than yours. What would you say to that? And you say, you know, I do see that Nelson would seem to be reaching a different conclusion. But that's because Nelson is actually asking a different question. And Nelson's question is 
is an excellent one and one that I have learned quite a bit from and I have studied his work closely. But he does begin from the premise of X, whereas I begin from the premise of Y. And because I begin from that premise, I use a different uh, toolkit of methodologies with a different orienting question. And because of that, I reach this other conclusion. And I believe that Nelson's conclusions and mine actually work quite well together to approach different aspects of this central question for our field. So you see what you did there, is you didn't come back, you didn't crumble, you didn't lose your poise, you also didn't immediately assume that you yourself was wrong, but you also didn't say that Nelson was wrong, if you understand. You're really charting a, a diplomatic middle path that nevertheless stands up for your perspective. Okay, if you read the blog post that I told you to, you will learn more about that. Because, and, and again, there is no substitute for practice. Absolutely no substitute for practice. These are all things. Nobody is born with these abilities. If you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this, don't feel bad. Nobody's born with these abilities. These are abilities you gain through practice. So please go to conferences, <laughs> give talks, Ask your professors to do mock job talks for you. Work with the professor is in, because we are totally available. If you don't have anyone else to work with, absolutely get in touch. But, um, but, but above all, get practice, and you will, you will improve. This is not an art. It's a craft, and it improves with practice. So with that, I'm going to stop. It's 1 o'clock. Well, it's 1 o'clock Pacific time. And um, I, so thank you very much. And please join me now in the Q&A on Chronicle Vitae where I will answer more questions for the next hour. And thank you and best of luck to you on the job market.